welcome back to the stream. Uh, this is Brain Better. Hey, I'm Jason. I'm here streaming as Brain Better at an unusual time for us. And today we have with us, uh, you know, Kai Wodeka, my co-host. Hello. And our excellent guest, uh, Yudanjay Vijayarat. Huh? Good morning, everyone. Who is a he's a science fiction author, data scientist. He's been nominated for the Nebula. And he, this very odd hour for our stream is because he's actually joining us from Colombo, Sri Lanka. So you can go check out his website at uh, udanje.com, uh, spelled just like his name that appears under him. Uh, but otherwise, just yeah, stick around. We're going to talk for the next hour or so about basically AI, GPT, and machine creativity. Because the cool thing, and the reason why we invited him to come on the stream and chat with us here, is that at this year at the World Science Fiction Convention in New Zealand, or at least in virtual New Zealand on New Zealand time, that we all attended from these seats we're in right now, he gave a really interesting talk about how he used uh, AI, and uh, basically text-generative AI, to help him write some of his existing and upcoming novels. And so that was really cool. And we had just a little bit of time in that panel to go over it because, of course, there also had to be a whole bunch of explanation of what it means to use AI in text generation. And I want to skip over all of that basic stuff because I know if you've been here on this channel, you have access to the explanations we've already done of that stuff. And if you haven't, there are some great uh, links on the web that you can go follow. But for right now, if you're here with us live, we're just going to talk straight through, assuming you already know a thing or two about text generating AI. So let's dive right in. So Yuda, tell me, the thing I think I'm curi most curious about is how did you initially get interested in text generating AI? Wow, okay, that's a good, that's a good question out of the gate. Um, I think it started because um, somewhere, I, I was, so I come at this not from a classical, my sort of classical academic work, whatever the papers that I write, are largely in um, in linguistics and on the intersection of like tech and policy. So from one side, there was this interest for me on, um, and I also run a fact checker. So I've, I've, so I've actually been mucking around using models to classify misinformation because like all fact checkers, we are uh, understaffed. Uh, Burnout is mental burnout, particularly is pretty high, and anything that I can use as an assistive tool, I will absolutely use. Um, but from the other side, I, I'm a gamer. I, I absolutely love procedurally generated games, right? <laughs> I, I mean, the, uh, from yes. uh, from Diablo, like I, I'm from sort of from the '90s generation, so I won't be able to pull out examples like Mud, but from Diablo onwards, um, and pretty much all of the games that I played, uh, because I had a very very shitty Pentium 2. Uh, somewhere in 2012 that that I you know we had we, uh, we, we had saved up and bought second hand so I used to play a lot of games that had memory limitations and the best way of getting around memory limitations is to procedurally generate stuff um, so I found it fascinating that um, you know you know when I when I started writing novels I still kept thinking back to that dream of being a game designer someday and be and actually using procedural generation. I would, I'm the sort of guy who obsess over the Minecraft algorithm and try to figure out the surface area of what it generates. Um, so I, I always found it fascinating that uh, in game design there have always been tools that have assisted in the creation of worlds, because at a certain level you run into practical considerations like memory, like how many programmers you have, how many designers you have, and you start building automated tooling to solve some of these problems um, and, and to ensure that gamers have multiple playthroughs that are enjoyable. And novels sort of seem to be in, in like the dark ages of tech. So when GPT-2 came out, um, I thought, okay, like until that point, there had, for me, in my head at least, there had not really been a need for me to do this because um, I had been, the closest I had gotten was I had read pretty much all of Agatha Christie's novels and I drew and, I drew and designed this elaborate series of Markov chains to create a detective, cyberpunk detective novel. And the protagonist is this guy called Michael Markov and his love interest is Paige Rank and they go to Dykstra's bar. <laughs> so it was basically just me punning and, and the villains would sort of be the number of limbs where they appear, the whole nine yards, the whodunits, the red herrings, everything would just be picked out of this large field and I looked at that and I thought, well, I've kind of spent a few months on this. 
I could have actually written the handbook myself. Uh, so I, I, I did that and I kind of put it aside. But when GPT-2 came out, that was interesting because that cut down the training time significantly. And I thought, okay, let's pull all that stuff back out of the closet. And instead of going on this whole trip of can, um, can GPT-2 or some or any transform model or anything of the sort, can it write a novel? Which always seemed to me a bit, a bit kind of stupid, an approach, because the classic computer science method is to take a corpus of text, you feed it in, and you get gibberish. You get well punctuated, but absolute gibberish, because a novel contains multiple sets of patterns. You have your punctuation, you have capitalization, you have the language artifacts, then you have plot, character, and all of these things. Now, we as authors have found way to, ways to reduce this, you know, using beat structures, save the cat, Vladimir Props 31 stage uh, folklore uh, breakdown, but we have not really bothered to properly, uh, I would say, annotate the meta, the data that we feed in to do a good enough job at that. So I thought, okay, um, that requires huge amounts of, uh, you know, insane amounts of text corpora that I will then have to summarize and distill and annotate down to the nth degree. And because I, I do work in linguistics, I build uh, language corpora for resource poor languages like Sinhala, my native language. So, you know, I'm dealing with like a couple of hundred million words at any given moment. So I, I knew that would be a task that would get me nowhere without a massive team. So I thought instead, let me see if I can automate components of world building very much like the game designers did. And have been doing it since since LA, since LA, I think, yeah. And Matt, then... I saw the uh, blog post on your website where you talked about sort of being inspired by some of that game design and that thing of yeah. these little yeah. nuggets of sort of meaning that our brains kind of fill in the rest of the details around because they're evocative. Yes, yes. So I went and read uh, what Tarn Adams has to say. Now, I personally think Tarn Adams is one of the best game designers on the planet. Uh, Dwarf Fortress guy. Um, the amount of uh, simulation that that game has going on just boggles the mind. Um, so I went and read what he had to say and what the designer of RimWorld had to say. And they both hinged on this concept called apophenia, which is the human tendency to pick out patterns in the noise. And I thought, okay, so what we what we're really building is if the noise generated has a certain amount of coherency, the reader or rather me, the writer who's using those things will supply the rest of it and there can now be a proper collaboration. And I poked around, um, Kasparov had done this for advanced chess, right? But Kasparov got beaten uh, by Deep Blue. He came back with advanced chess and said, well, what if we make it instead of human versus machine? Why do we make it human plus machine versus human plus machine? So I went along that route. And do you know what? That, that's actually been surprisingly fruitful. Um, more, more even than, uh, so I've been using, um, I retrained GPT-2 to uh, be a poet bot. I initially did a test drive on Instagram, which probably wasn't very ethical, but there is an actual Instagram bot. Uh, who gained a very small following and there are humans commenting going oh my god your poetry is so amazing it, it really touches my heart and tested that okay minor Turing test passed and started using it in a novel where um, where essentially there's a machine poet and there's an actual machine poet supplying the words of the machine poet um, but just as useful were you know basic Markov chain based planet generators that I built and things that predict, tell me what the weather is going to be like on every chapter. And there's a random event generator that occasionally throws like very weird e events at me. And those are, those are honestly just as useful. So I can't help but think about this in the same lens as we look at randomness in role-playing games as a way mm. to keep everybody at the table from needing to constantly be a really good author who can come up with cool stuff every moment but instead throw some cool stuff and it sticks or it doesn't. And especially with an editing process, if it doesn't stick, you're, there's no rule that says you have to keep everything the machine threw at you. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think D&D &D would honestly be one of the best things that you could, you, one of the, I would say, one of the lowest hanging fruit for automation because there's already so much thought that's gone into that system. 
to, to make it as modular as possible and to make sure that all those little pieces connect without too many rough edges in the way. Uh, yeah, honestly, like to any RPG, uh, particularly the old cyber, like the original cyberpunk RPG, I'd be very interested in seeing how that could be coupled together. But I think that's also like what I'm reminded from the original cyberpunk RPG, those tables and tables of like gear and settings and <laughs> vaguely fleshed out characters. I feel like they perform some of the same purpose in that way of kicking the human into a more creative mode by just giving them a bunch of concrete examples to noodle on. Absolutely. Well, I've also seen like pages online that make, you know, character generators where just they will give you a random character in this setting. Yes. And, you know, they're basically picking from random tables, but it's that same thing of human-assisted, human tools to spark the human. Yes, yes. So I try, like, um, I sometimes get into arguments with, like, GPT-3 fanboys when I say pure text generation is not necessarily the future. That architecture is, uh, like, if you, if you take, uh, did you see uh, GPT-3 writing as William Gibson? Yes. Oh, I saw it because you talk, You uh, put it in your uh, in your talk. I mean, that that was fantastic, right? Where it talks about uh, like critiquing Heinlein and and how science fiction writers have not really been able to predict the future. But it's also surprising how often we the seeds of the future are already existing and we don't really pay attention to them. But that's still not the future because that thing took so many GPUs and twelve million dollars to train. Yep. Um, You'd hire a copywriter for much less. Uh, so, what I what I keep saying it's it's more we have to decompose these things into systems like a character generator, where you have a deep understanding of the fundamental bones that go into something, and then using that you can generate something else. Which we because there is a certain form that we expect, there is a certain palette, a template that we draw from, and you sort of build systems within that template, and then you get. Uh, your Minecrafts, your No Man's Sky after the update, not the, original, <laughs> not the first release. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, and part of what I'm thinking about, this is also how we do things as humans. Like you were talking about, you have these story beats for writing a novel, and that's not the same skill that we use for making sort of the prose on the page sound good to read. It's these bunch of different skills that we all bring together. Absolutely. And I think authors actually do an insane amount of pattern recognition, uh, which people, you know, a lot of people don't give themselves credit for. But the the amount of patterns that we are dealing with, I mean, the, even the idea of holding a story consistent and coherent for a single character across 300 pages, that's a task that, you know, even GPT-3 still has not been able to crack. We're still dealing with very small sample stuff. Um, but then perhaps we can use that to do small sample stuff. Now, one of the interesting things that uh, I saw in, so before we uh, got together, you sent me a paper uh, from the folks observing NanoGenmo, which is National Novel Generation. Oh, yes. And yes. one of the things that they were talking about in that paper that I found really interesting, I was wondering if you ended up also examining yourself, was the use of multiple systems to design to basically to generate a narrative where basically taking one system to build for example the plot scaffolding and then feeding that plot scaffolding into another system which fleshed it out into mm. language yes and those those seem to be the most promising and i i think that's actually closest to going back to kai's point of how we work as well um uh, i'm not speaking representative for all authors but generally for me writing a novel is there's a large period of research then there's a period of trying to outline things, then there's figuring out the characters, and then you let those characters. So it's really multiple different skills that are being activated. So it makes sense to have different uh, systems feeding into one, one another, because unlike a human, what we're building are fairly, like highly specialized. Uh, I wouldn't call them systems either, but very highly specialized tools that are only really good at one thing, and you can train it onto another, but it just goes south after a certain point. Uh, what did you think of uh, the NanoGenmo paper and, and sort of the successes highlighted in it? So I thought it was interesting both in terms of where those successes came from and in terms of some of the limitations. Uh, actually, mm. I'll bring up the NanoGenmo paper so we can maybe scroll through it and discuss it a little since uh, sure. you know, we have that. Uh, did you see Geoffrey Hinton's tweet when GPT-3 came out? Uh, I didn't see that one, no. Um, 
I, I might have seen it re uh, requoted without context, though. So what was it? Uh, extrapolating the spectacular performance of GP3 into the future suggests that uh, the answer to life, the universe, and everything is just 4.398 trillion parameters. It was a burn. It was a proper burn. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's basically <laughs> yeah. the, the thing with GPT. If you really like, once yeah. you pull away all the layers, fundamentally, GPT is that kid who memorized the textbook. In this case, the textbook is the sum total of what humans have written on the internet, mostly as filtered through Reddit. Yes. But yes. it's... I'm, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm impressed by GPT-2 because, you know, it, it, this isn't practicality to, say, the 345 m model, where you can run it on a laptop, you can retrain it, you can use it. But uh, in three, GPT-3 is not an improvement on the architecture. Architecturally, it's still a transformer. It is just basic as all hell. They just throw it as much data and as many gpus in the problem as possible it's just here yeah, take everything that that is that's not smart that's brute forcing a problem yeah. did you know we can throw money at problems because we can yeah we can just make this all go away <laughs> so so here we go i've got the uh, nano genmo paper up let me see if i can switch to it yes it worked all right so yes uh, Na native so generation in the wild so this was based on nano genmo 2018 uh, and folks are challenged to generate a 50,000-word novel, which is the same parameters as basically NaNoWriMo. Strangely, given that its name echoes, you'd think there might be uh, inspired or something, because they are. But the key thing they're talking about here, they spend a lot of time talking about coherence. Oh, right, you can't highlight PDFs really well. So I'm going to scroll down here a little, talk about narrative coherence. I think this is one of the interesting, th one of the interesting things they had here. They looked a little at the type of stuff that came out and kind of kicked out, okay, visual art, poetry, word art, we're going to kind of kick those out of our consideration. We're looking at folks who actually tried to make a novel, or at least something noveloid. Yeah, yeah. having generated poetry, uh, poetry is pretty easy, by the way. It's like the lowest hanging fruit. Um, I, re I achieved reasonable results with a corpus of 300 poems and about... 10 hours of retraining on GPT-2, 3, 4, 5 M. Um, and it was, it was really not that, like, later versions had more sophisticated corpora, of course, but poetry gets a pass because there's a lot of what we take for granted, the structure, uh, the character parts, continuing for a long period of time. You don't have most of that stuff unless you're trying to do a, a T.S. Eliot. Very few people are. One of the interesting things, we actually also discovered a domain that has that same sort of uh, pass because uh, I at least got my start with GPT by generating quotes for comics because uh, they wanted to play a little stand-up comedy game. And we, uh, we actually did a bunch of that here on the channel showing how it worked. But basically, right. they, want, they had a database of things that they'd said that their audience had found funny and put into their quote database. And we trained GPT-2 right. small, the, just their small, the smallest release on that. The 117M? Yeah, the 117M. Again, that yeah. took, uh, and in fact, using the, uh, the the 375, I believe, uh, was actually made it worse. It overtrained much more easily. But we uh, basically yes. found with only a couple of hours of training, and in fact, I think when we actually went and uh, rented a cloud machine that was properly configured with a GPU for training, a couple of mm. minutes of training, like 20s of minutes, that it was generating mm. quotes that were pretty good like good enough that we started doing exhaustive checks of uh, text similarity which was the more expensive part needing to do a uh, you know, some levenstein distance checks to make sure we hadn't accidentally recapitulated the output yeah, and yeah. sometimes it had yeah. and the thing with that yeah. with comedy is non sequitur is often a part of comedy so mm. it, it, again it gets a buy on it because if it, something doesn't make sense maybe that's the joke absolutely absolutely Something interesting we observed, and I'm curious if you observed it with the poetry, is one of the things it did pretty well at was sort of uh, what I've heard termed as the snow clone pattern, uh, where it would discover that you could kind of put the, uh, there's a phrase and it has this noun in it. And the noun is kind of one of those inherently funny nouns. And so it would start subbing it for other nouns it had seen in that same funny spot in other jokes. And it would start oh, mixing up jokes by um... treating like the nouns between them. Okay, so I saw that in 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 a type in a particular type of poem. Um, I was training on Pablo Neruda, mm. and Neruda, Neruda talks a lot about politics and Spain and so on and so forth. And there was this particular rebellion that kept coming up 
even in context where it made no sense. And it would uh, this this whole narrative of the breakaway that that particular uh, there were certain phrases uh, for the masses. It just kept appearing after a certain while, but um, but mind you, that was with uh, with a test data set on 117M. Uh, once mm -hmm. I switched to 345M, that some of that problem went away. Because at that point, it, at that point, Spain was still like this anthology of poetry that I showed off at at, at Worldcon. Um, Spain is still a dominant theme there. That there's a lot of talk about secession and rebellion and so on, and that's coming from Neruda. However, some of those inherited elements are not there anymore. And I tried with um, the seven six five model, I think. Mm -hmm. um, seven six five actually um, just like you said, it kind of went backwards. Uh, was difficult to train, took up a huge amount of uh, memory, left it training for a long while, about a thousand cycles, and at the end, uh, it, it kind of was overfitting to a, to a whole other level where it was just taking whole paragraphs wholesale for entire verses and just sticking them in there. I was like, ah, no. Um, but I've seen this. I've seen this most often in um, in in that type of poetry, which. To, which has a story in it, which has causality in it, which mm. has an implication of the movement of time. Uh, and there, it seems this seems to do quite badly. However, um, I discovered that when I was training on some of my favorite Chinese poets, 5th century Tang Dynasty, where their style of poetry is less about a moving narrative and more about taking a sort of snapshot of a particular moment, a particular emotion, framing it in terms of particularly the visuals of the place uh, which this poet encountered this emotion. So it's like a Polaroid and it is a fixed moment in time that it is surprisingly good at. That makes sense That's to some extent. That's like, yeah, it, it almost, we've redefined the problem to remove the thing that GPT is worst <laughs> at, which is sequencing yes. time and sequencing events. It said, just take one fixed yes. moment. Yes, just just remove uh, the whole time dimension, like remove an entire dimension of the problem altogether. And actually, I feel like that fits. I found the section we were looking for in here, the narrative coherence methods. Uh, and so I think this is pretty interesting that uh, so we had the high level specification idea of basically putting in, OK, we're going to tell this these fictions what their what their sort of narrative coherence will be. But then we get into some of these others. Uh, well, oh, yeah, I forgot how long this paper is. Like, this is kind of the interesting one, the simulation, where they used a model, because I feel like, again, we, we're coming back to Dwarf Fortress here, of take a simulation, run it. Yes, the base model, yeah. 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 Um, so simulations have, uh, have like, uh, a really robust advantage in that they often generate stuff that you won't expect. Um, and the other type has the advantage in that it generates the structure that you want almost all the time. However, you're going to see large amounts of repetitive elements. I honestly think simulation is the way forward. Uh, Dwarf Fortress in particular seems to have cracked this for its history generator. Its histories are is something else altogether. Um, however, like um, over here, they had uh, in the narrative coherence section, I think at some point they had talked about um, Vladimir Prop, I think, and the, the hero's journey, the monomyth, uh, cutting these mm -hmm. things down into like the, the patterns that authors follow. Mm -hmm. um, I think there may be a way around this. Um, there's a there's a corpus of data called the CMU Movie Summary Corpus, which yes. is millions, yes, millions of movie summaries, and those are those are essentially the plot distilled down into a paragraph, which is within the attention spans of almost any of the garden variety text generation methods we can use. So what if you take that and you generate just a plot and then you use other systems to expand that because in a summary, uh, the reason like generative methods work so well on paper abstracts uh, or on summaries of anything is because in a summary, each of the words has a much higher value than in a novel because you're, you've, you've given a certain amount of space, you have to fit everything in there. And so every single word is automatically of much higher informational value. That's robust. That's that's very robust data for It also seems like to a certain extent in something like a summary or an abstract, you're not actually expecting yeah. to return to concepts. You're expecting each sentence is going to be progressing it forward, not returning yes. to the previous yes. subject. Yes, exactly. And you know, you 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 again, you're you're doing the. I seem to be doing this often. You're stripping away parts of the problem, 
um, and the advantage of that is you end up with cleaner and more coherent data because at the end of the day, all these things are just garbage in, garbage out, still applies. Oh, and yeah. yeah, and you know, that person who threw like all the Harry Potter novels and they generated like a page of it, that's 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 just that's amateur, that's that's painful. Uh, but if we have good data like this where you've reduced the problems down, your sentences don't vary a lot in summaries or abstracts. There's a certain accepted sentence structure. You don't do flowery prose. So a lot of that has been stripped out. As Kai pointed out, it's highly sequential. You don't go back and reminisce about what happened on page one. You don't have characters having flashbacks. In fact, you barely have character uh, histories or interactions at all. So you're basically just sequencing the events. I think this is robust for yeah. using text generators with. Yeah, and uh, this is, by the way, what I pulled up here is this is the homepage of the corpus, which has on it the summary of Indiana Jones here, which if you read this, yeah, it is, again, it is super condensed. It's like instant spoilers. Just do you want to have the, the summary of this movie downloaded? We can do that. But, I mean, that movie is how long? That's like, what, uh, you know, almost two hours. And we've summarized it into, a, I can't get a word count immediately, but that's really, you know, quite dense. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, like, in something like this, because I think stuff like this is where generative text would be really useful, because now, say, for example, you have something generating plot summaries, and then you have a writer actually taking that and spinning it and doing the, you know, actually layering on style and substance and the whole nine yards. I, I think that's a much more robust method because then you have actually you actually have something to do for the human in a position that they're really good at. Like humans are really good generalist engines. Um, we can act, absolutely take this and write it in the style of Salman Rushdie or write it in the style of John Scalzi or, or, or you know, Malka Older would be a little bit harder to emulate. But yes, <laughs> you can try. But that's, that's really where you want a human coming in, where you can go, oh, right, I've just read this interesting novel and I'd like to try nine different first-person perspectives on this story. Good, go ahead, do it, shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> the thing that, that sort of makes me think about is sort of the framework and then a human takes it is in role-playing games, the idea of sort of the boxed adventure where you there's this published thing that is the framework of a plot, the framework of... A game and then the game master actually picks it up and goes okay let's make this a real story let's give it life and it's that same process of taking a framework and expanding it absolutely absolutely yeah uh, the only difference is that um, with with generators we are not fully aware of how those linkages happen uh, mm -hmm. with something like dnd for example you can write a sequence of good work of chains to basically emulate uh, a dm you may not have some of the you may not have some of the interactions that a good DM has with with players and some of the interactivity and the, the storyline being shaped. But if you wanted like out of the box D and D campaigns, you can absolutely do that. In, and in fact, there are plenty of generators that already do this. Um, someone had used uh, GPT two to create AI dungeon. Have you seen that? Yes, yes. AI dungeon is <laughs> yeah. AI dungeon is very amusing. And, and again, yeah, though, it shows yeah. that, that lack of global consistency. I think that's really one of the interesting things about, in general, what we've seen out of the GPT series is that it takes increasingly exponential quantities of compute to create sort of a linear increase in the window of through which it can maintain kind of a coherent thought. Absolutely. But though I, I do maintain that it's it might possibly be a data problem because... If you look at what OpenAI is doing there, basically scraping Reddit links, taking the top ones, looking at that article, scraping that, sticking into a corpus called web text. Uh, and, and that's a huge amount of unstructured data. Now, if if the three of us were to read every good fantasy novel in the last 30 years, and we were to decompose, and we somehow arrived at an agreement that we would all decompose them using, say, the hero's journey. Uh, constrained so obviously we're going to miss stuff but if you can break it down and provide that level of annotated data i'm pretty sure we can actually have uh, machine generation that is a lot more coherent a lot more consistent and you can actually start generating plots it's a matter of creating good data uh, as much as it is a problem of technically innovating all the algorithm because 
uh, we are seeing a lot of um, compute being thrown at the problem. Like I said, we are not seeing a lot of innovation on the algorithm front. We are not seeing a lot of innovation on the data front. Like this, the CMU movie corpus is an insane amount of work. And it is probably more, you know, for the task of storage generation, it's far more valuable than just like crawling Reddit and throwing everything and the, and the kitchen sink at, at a transform model. So one of the things I do want to carry forward here is uh, we've got a comment from virtual assistant in our chat that uh, you know basically no one has the data necessary for machine learning lying around. And they're proposing that maybe I, I... like natural language processing type systems might be a way forward for that. But I do think that's a great criticism. Yeah. Which, I... yeah. <laughs> I, abs I absolutely agree as, as someone. So like uh, what I've been doing for the last two years is because my native language doesn't teach, is not really computationally. Oh God, I can talk about Unicode for decades. Um, <laughs> it, it's just, uh, you know, you, you can't really do stuff with it uh, if you're writing a program. So I've, I've collected 28 million words of text from face Facebook statuses. Uh, pointed out that now we have the highly formal language, the informal language that you use for Singhala. This is set about 500 years back. This is sort of news media. Then you have multiple degrees of code mixing that lead to multiple dialects of, of like your online usage. And it, it's, it's, an, it's, a hard, it's, it's a lot of hard work. And this is just one tiny step on the NLP foundation. Um, I don't think anybody has the data uh, yet. There may be ways in which the data can be created or rather bolstered. If you can have, say, for example, uh, if, if you can use, say, that example that I that we I used earlier, where we are reading fantasy novels from the last thirty years. If we say were to take half of that, if we were to take half of the corpora that generates, then use weak generators to uh, to create summaries, noisy summaries for another half of that, and then the combined corpus would have enough noise and enough pattern for it to be used somewhere. And this is this sort of boosting is, is a technique often used as a hack in like um, in Kaggle and, and many other competitions where you start with a small corpus, you use yep. that to train a large, a large corpus, and then you go ahead. That is, that's one possible approach. And I think that definitely needs to be explored a lot more. Um, the other approach is for a lot of this stuff, it's using a human is still cheaper. Mm -hmm. I mean, I say this as a human being used <laughs> to write stories. It's still, it's still far cheaper um, to sort of point me at a problem and go, can you write a book about that or a short story about that? Um, the second uh, thing is like, if, n if nobody has the data, sh shouldn't we re-examine the problem? What are we trying to generate here? Because I really don't see value in using um, NLP or machine learning and the, the umbrellas cross at times um, to generate stories. I think humans are, as Terry Pratchett pointed out, we are not homo sapiens. We are pan narrants, not the wise man, but the storytelling monkey. We are storytellers by default. We interpret the world around us through stories. Uh, early human beings crawled out of a cave and saw rain and then, oh, well, when I pee, water comes out. Well, someone really large is peeing down on me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so big brain move. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> literally a break my So we are really good at generating stories. Our societies, large parts of our societies, if you look at constitutions, public policy, if you look at law, many of those contain moral values that are rather encapsulated in, I would say, the genre of religious epic fantasy. Mm -hmm. We are pretty, we're pretty good at that. So perhaps we should be using these systems of what they're good at. Use them for world building. Well, I think one of the other things that, that you talked about earlier about working with the AI, working sort of in collaboration with it, gets at one of mm. my sort of pet concepts that I would love to see more in the world, which is the idea of cognitive prosthesis, where there are systems out right. there that, that expand human capability. And instead of us yeah. looking constantly at, well, how do we get the computer to do this instead of us? It's how do we get the computer yes. to automate the crappy parts of this so that we can focus do, on the yes. easy parts that we like that are good so, for us. So I, um, uh, so I didn't, I admit that I could not, uh, I couldn't do this properly. Like I don't have a, I don't have a reasonable control group to test against, but generally for me, writing a novel takes about a year and a half worth of research, eight months of solid writing, many packs of cigarettes. Um, that novel that I <laughs> talked about, 
um, I wrote it in two months. Oh, wow. Yeah, that is... Once, once the crap was automated. And I thought, well, okay, this uh, didn't take a lot of time on this. Um, and the publisher looked at it and went, um, we like this. Can you do a trilogy? So there is an element of a Turing test. It's not very scientific, though, which is why I hesitate to put it forward. But it greatly reduced the time I take the time I took to to you know write a story and tell something that I'm proud of and both comfortable with and proud of, uh, and I think there's a lot more of that. We're not scientists here; we're engineers, and so if you get one system working, that uh, is a proof. That's a, a proof by example. So we'll take it. And now we just need to see what happens if we try to run it in production. So the next two books of the trilogy, if you if they also come through easily, Absolutely. now we've got it working correctly in production. Um, so I have. Um, for the second book, I created a very basic galaxy generator in R. I mean, that, that, that stuff's easy, right? Uh, just know the distribution of stars and so on and so forth, uh, and the types of planets that can be generated. And um, then I got a little bit lazy because I realized I don't really want to know the absolute questions of these things. I don't really care about whether it's perfect represented. For story purposes, I need things that lead to the other. So um, I had the planets and the stars setting each other as sources and targets so that the plants and, and various civilization artifacts would start orbiting the stars and the stars would link to each other and my explanation for this was worm pools. Um, but what I ultimately did was create a social network of stars and planets. And then I used Lobain, um, basic community de detection algorithm to run community detection based on the idea of your community is what you connect to more than you connect to others. And so now you have these, these stars and planets being grouped into little clusters that then represent little empires. And there is, and there is a perfect path for this whole thing because you can, run, you can now run a random walker from one end of the node map to the other, and that's your story. <laughs> the empires that you cross, the stars that you come across, the random civilizational artifacts that you bump into. That's my second, <laughs> that's the second book. I haven't told the publisher yet. They'll obviously think I'm crazy. Look, the thing that's fascinating to me here is this, this this thing of people telling stories again. And so what do you care about? It's not the stars. It's the people as proxied by the empires. Yes. So yeah, it's the social network of yes. the star system. Yes. Yes. I I sometimes like, uh, I, I occupy this weird space where people who write cyberpunk sort of fiction think um, I'm a lot harder science fiction than them and people who write hard science fiction think, oh, oh that's, a, that's a social networks and economics guy. I was like, look, we, we, it, the stories are interesting to us if it's human centric. A volcano explodes in the middle of the ocean, absolutely nobody gives a damn. A volcano explodes and kills 150 people. Everybody in the world is gonna look at that. We are fundamentally interested in things about us. We talk about us too much, as I'm doing. <laughs> but well, this is how what, humans work. This is how, yeah, this is how humans work. This is what we're here for. Like, and all of this AI we build, in a sense, this has always been one of the reasons I'm so interested in AI is there's all of this talk about, you know, the the world ending AI, the Skynet AI. And I think it's much more interesting mm -hmm. and much more probable that AI is just going to become part of us. Yeah, like, I think I actually have come to hate Terminator for how much it has influenced that. Like, I, I love the first two Terminator movies. The others I pretend never happened. Um, but, you know, this idea of Skynet, A, the moral system, the, I mean, there's no, no reason a sane AI, if it's already on the internet, it's already on every device, why would it bother with building a physical army? Like, why would you muck around with meat space if you already have every device on the planet? You're good, man. You're good. Uh, but but that aside, this idea... Maybe if you need to do something physical, humans are still cheaper. Exactly. Uh, and this idea of an AGI replacing us, uh, what I always say for these discussions, is because there's a, because I work in the, in the civ civil society sector, Ish, so we deal with government. So there's a lot of narratives pulling back and forth, including people who have no idea what the, what the hell they're talking about, suddenly controlling the budgets for millions of dollars of AI research, AI research, uh, by which they mean writing essays uh, of TechCrunch. But, <clears throat> right. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of that fear. And I always keep saying, look back to other times when we have shown this fear. We showed this for electricity. 
we showed this for cars, where one element of, of society is being replaced or automated by another, and look at what happened. Now, there is an argument to be made. It's being made by the World Economic Forum, the Fourth Industrial Revolution article, which says, for the first time, change is cutting across both white-collar and blue-collar jobs. Um, to which I say, change has always been cutting across both white-collar and blue-collar jobs, um, because the argument is that previously, all automation took out blue-collar jobs, uh, low-skilled labor. Right. And, you know, that, that skill can be... The people operating in low skill brackets have transversal skills. So those skills can be, say, for example, someone who's a carpenter would find it easier to become a bricklayer than someone who's a programmer to become a French teacher. There's a certain amount of specialization and knowledge that goes in. You run into sunk costs and you find it difficult to switch. It's a bit problematic, but um, you change has already, all, always been cutting across uh, those white collar jobs. If you take accounting, the Medici's invented double entry accounting in what the 13th century, um, and you had you had armies of accountants and writers and scribes to take care of the books. Now we have Microsoft Excel, and one person who's really underpaid is just entering data, right? And we've automated out a massive amount of that workforce. We barely even noticed. We haven't talked about it even. We do this constantly. Um, telephone operators. Switchboard operators were a thing where they go, oh, please wait, I'll connect you and pull the plug out and connect it. We've automated that entire thing out and we, by and large, we take it as a good thing. Um, I, I think there is a little bit, this narrative of Skynet and AI taking us over, it's a little bit overplayed. It's not just a little bit, a lot overplayed. We are nowhere near AGI yet. And the human brain at the end of the day is a product of millions of years of evolution, 10,000 of which are optimized to survive in societies. We are the apex predator on the planet because we are pretty damn good at it. We are insanely good generalist engines. I have absolutely no fear that we'll adapt. What I do fear is what path governments will take because that will dictate life for people at the bottom of the pyramid. If governments go, I want the money, and let's not have social nets for people and redistribute that, then we have problems. If a government goes, I'll take that money, let's use that to enable people to reskill and actually use that generalism to figure out what new avenues they can take in the future, then wonderful. Then we have human plus machine collaboration going on. I so like I think all these yeah. fears get condensed into that versus AI. It's one target. It's got Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg's face painted on it, and you can go smash it with a hammer, and everybody will cheer you on. It's, it's too simple. It's too simple a narrative. I, I strongly agree with all of that, so <laughs> I'm not going to be the one to dispute here. Uh, I you know Personally, I feel like one of the things that's interesting is that as we build systems, one of the challenges for people like me who are building these systems that automate things is that question of, are you putting people out of work? And the, the secondary question related to that of, why is it bad to make it so humans don't need to do a thing anymore if that thing is still getting done? And the answer is that we have an obsession with making people work, <laughs> but that's beyond the scope of programmers to solve, I think. <laughs> Yes, I think um, there is that. There is also the, I mean, Gibson's line about the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. It is such a fantastic line because I work in the global south. I, and most of the, I've worked with 10 or 12 countries so far, governments. These are what you would call third world governments. Like, so Sri Lanka, like where I live now, um, we have free education, free universal health care. Uh, I would, I'd never have to worry about getting sick. I know I can just walk into a doctor's thing, even if it's private, I'll only pay like $20 for a full body checkup and resetting fractures or whatever. However, we are we are a third world country, uh, um, particularly in COVID times, um, our primary exports are tea, rubber, coconut um, software um, and um, maids to the Middle East. So, there is, a, there is the economic impact as well to be considered where, you know, once people are put out of work and what happens, where does the money go to? For example, mm -hmm. if there are 10 people in Sri Lanka doing um, in a call center and Facebook suddenly comes up with the bot that can handle that part. So does the money go to someone who needs it or does the money go to someone who has exponential power 
in the marketplace to the point where it's not really a free market anymore. It's basically someone who can ruffle stomp over everyone else just by throwing a few million bucks at the problem and disrupting themselves. That sets up very unequal territory. But those are questions of economics and policy and not necessarily um, technology because technology is always going to be disrupting things. Um, the wheel disrupted the lives of people who carted stuff around on their shoulders and carried blocks around. But this is this is how things work. We need to address that with good social policy um, and and a better understanding of economics. Like our economics, is, our classical economics is utter and absolute crap. It's mostly a bunch of math stolen and like we did we have we didn't even see a proper supply demand curve in action. And this is like hundreds of years of economic theory, we didn't see a supply demand curve in action until Uber came around and gave us the surge pricing data, right? And this is like 150 years of economic theory. It's been, so we need to think a lot more robustly around those systems instead of just saying, oh my God, that tech is bad. Yeah. Yeah. No disagreement here. <laughs> So one thing I did want to ask, you mentioned that uh, you worked, you know, you collaborated with AI tools on this new system. Have you used any of the tools that are sort of in the AI autocomplete space? I know that GPT has been pushing on some of that of the put some sentence together and we'll help you put more words into this sentence. No, no, not really. I, I haven't really uh, examined that because from my perspective, at least it seems a lot more work. Because now I have to complete, create a sentence, crub out a part of it, then say, can you use it? It's an intellectual curio, but I not really something I, I want to get into. But how have you have you seen stuff? Have you done stuff with it? How has no, it, it seemed really weird and uh, inefficient to me. And uh, I've been able to do no more with it than using it as an intellectual <laughs> curio. And I was wondering if, you know, as somebody who has practical experience co-writing with an AI, whether you managed to get any better out of it. Sounds like no. No, I mean... It, yeah, it, it's at the end of the day, there's, there's you can do so much with it, but this is like uh, Gauss's seventeen-sided polygon, right? It's very cool. <laughs> what the hell am I gonna do with it? Actually, that does that does bring up, I think, one of the interesting things about some of the some of the text generative systems that are not mm. GPT is it does mm. seem like some of them have other approaches to the structure of language. Uh, I'm actually I'm interested somewhat in Bert, uh, which is one of the models out of Google. I've been yes. I've been teaching it to try to play a, a game called Fibbage, which is where uh, yeah. you know, it's a variant of that old party game where everybody there's some fact and some keyword is missing from it, and everybody at the table puts in something they think everybody else will guess. They all get shuffled up, and everybody guesses what they think is the true one, which is shuffled in with them. Uh, and that one of the very interesting things has been that GPT, at least, is completely incapable of filling in a blank in a sentence. It needs to hmm. have a start, and then it needs to have full control over where it goes. Um, I think that's because BERT is bidirectional, right? Yes. Yes, BERT is. BERT is a much more sophisticated arch architecture than GPT is, and GPT just is left, left to right encoder. So it kind of makes sense So it would have to read, and it would also spaz out on Arabic. Oh, ah. that's interesting. I mean, I wonder... Yeah, I wonder if they correctly reversed Arabic. Uh, in, well, no, Arabic isn't in the GPT corpus. I remember looking at the language list. It's not. It's not. It's not. It would spaz out completely because oh, you're writing yeah. from right to left, right? <laughs> now, okay, now, now I'm wondering about encodings because I'm wondering, I know at least some of the, some of it, like Arabic is still encoded front to back, but it then is, dis is mm. rendered right to left. Where I, mm. So it's sort of, inc I wonder if the linear encoding would work. I wonder if a mixed corpus would confuse the heck out of it. <laughs> I, I strongly suspect that um, now, for example, uh, Singhala and English have slightly different, sub not slightly different, but we have different subject, object, verb orders. Mm -hmm. uh, if you threw a code mixed corpus in there, I think it would get absolute chaos. This is based on uh, me trying to mix Tang Dynasty and Pablo Neruda together. <laughs> created a mixed corpus with absolute ham on things. It was horrible to watch. <laughs> and uh, I also made the mistake of putting some William Blake in there. So you have, uh, as I sit here and behold the misty face of God. Like, huh? <laughs> uh, so, so you have like, you can absolutely break things. I suspect a large part of the success of these transfer models is in part because the corpora 
are selected so that they do give good results that are coherent results and are not particularly challenging cobra yeah that is and, and we get to that thing of things with a predictable structure something that the sort of machine can absolutely. learn absolutely and also morphologically poor right um, so english is a morphologically poor language which is why it's sort of easy to pick up as well if you take something like the Riau dialect of Sumatra, I am Makan, if I remember correctly, means the chicken is eating, the chicken has eaten, the chicken is being eaten, I am eating the chicken, we are eating the chicken. So something like that, where the inflection of the word carries a huge amount of meaning, would potentially be much more challenging than um, than English, where it's you can pretty much um, get the inflections right from reading uh, the text itself. And that makes me think too about some of the machine translation systems and how hmm. in some ways they expose some of the underlying assumptions and connections or lack thereof between languages. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. So we ran into this with Facebook. So uh, the, the corpus that uh, the corpus, corpus work that I do actually is using Facebook data. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because we are not Cambridge Analytica, we are nice people. Uh, we have back end access from them to see all public posts um, ever made since the start of Facebook. And you can use that to tune languages and so on. Um, so we ran into this with Singhala where they were like, oh, we have AI, for, we, have, we have AI for this. And I'm like, okay, what are we talking about? Can you give us specifics? And uh, because these are policy managers in the conversation, they didn't actually know either. But uh, the singular translations are horrible. And the romance translations, romance languages are actually a lot better and more robust. Um, so we went at this and we asked, well, why is this so bad? I mean, you technically are one of the largest corpora or text corpora repositories on earth. And then we realized, well, these they, have, they seem to have, at least um, particularly for the fast text libraries and so on, they seem to have taken Wikipedia singular and taken some articles from Wikipedia English, so the translation, and gone, okay, these have to be one-to-one -one translations of each other. Let's train on that, which is all kinds of stupid. A, they're not one-to-one -one translations. B, we're talking a language with multiple dialects, right? The formal version of written version of singular, which exists on Wikipedia, is actually so archaic and structured that most singular speakers have difficulty reading it, let alone when we don't speak it, period. A colloquial spoken is completely different. Colloquial written online is, again, completely different. We actually have two alphabets for this stuff, right? So they've just gone, okay, cool, let's just take this and this and boom. Um, so the, yeah, a lot of these underlying assumptions which kind of work okay for, I would say, the West Germanic set of languages. You have your English, French, Dutch, Afrikaans, those are languages roughly the same structures, very easily transferable uh, lessons. People take that. There's a lot of research around that. There's a lot of work around that. They take those assumptions by default and start applying them everywhere else. Um, we pointed out that um, in a paper we did, uh, even basic stuff like uh, basic topic modeling, like uh, LDA, if you run it on the Europal corpus, and that has I don't know about 12 or 15 languages, and these are professional translators working for for parliaments, right? So they have an obligation to make sure the rendering is accurate. You find that the same topic modeling algorithm running on English and French and Spanish highlight completely different topics as being priorities. Huh. So because, and I've been in, you know, I've been in symposiums where someone will say, oh, topic modeling lets us analyze all these comments from the FCC and all these hundreds of comments from the FCC and we can make these judgments based on the topics and themes that we see emerging. And I'm going, you do realize you change one small thing about the underlying language. All of your assumptions just go out the window, right? This is <laughs> this nice Chomskyite view of the world doesn't really hold in practice. So I think uh, we're coming up on the end of time. So is there anything that you'd like to kind of wrap things up with to summarize? Um, uh, to summarize, I think uh, GPT-3 AI writing stories hype is overblown. Uh, I think, however, that assistive collaborative AI tools, very unexplored space, uh, should definitely be explored more. I think game design has a lot more lessons to teach us, uh, particularly particularly more so than formal academia, I'd say. 
Um, and I think obvious authors should be exploring that. I, I'm, I'm certainly intent on doing so. Uh, and I also think that, you know, there may possibly at some point be a future where you have a Shakespeare 2.0 and you have, um, you have a Gibson bot. Um, we're probably not a Gibson bot, but we, we've <laughs> generally shown that we do like, particularly if you look at the romance and thriller genres, we have shown market research shows that humans do like a certain amount of predictability. In a, and this isn't these predictable plots are not what we consider the high literature, the canon that sort of breaks all conventions. But most of the stuff that we read, but day in and day out, uh, there's an element of predictability, has certain components that we want to see. There may come a future where a largely uh, machine system may be able to churn out hundreds of James Patterson novels. Um, and at that point, the only question is to ask, well, does it really matter mm -hmm. if it's a if it's a human and 20, 20 odd other writers churning out novels with the same pattern or a machine churning out the same pattern? I think at the end of the day, consumers enjoyment or what you get out of it should be what you matter, uh, should be what matters. And uh, potentially we may see the likes of James Patterson just drowning the market with even more you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, books co-written with AI. If so, okay, good. This is this opens up a very interesting playing field as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. It'll be interesting. Absolutely. Maybe live in interesting times. <laughs> oh, we do. We sure do. <laughs> All right, so before we let you go, uh, where can folks who are watching and interested find your books? Um, I'm mostly on Amazon.com. Uh, if you search for my name, you'll find it. There are some books uh, that you won't find there, however, because my some of my publishing deals are with the Indian subcontinent, and maybe in the US at some point. Um, uh, there is a book called Numbercast, which I think most people who are interested in this space of conversation, tech and policy and interactions with, with the humanity, I, I think they will appreciate that. And I don't know if they will appreciate anything else I've written. So <laughs> caveat it. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Amazon is where, is where I'm at. Excellent. Anything else? Uh, and if I'm Twitter, anything? it's tw twitter.com slash Yudanje, and that's me. All right. Well, I think this is probably a good place for us to finish up then. So thanks so much to everybody who came out and watched and uh, chatted with us. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Yuda. Thank you for having me, despite delays on my end. Uh, it's okay. We, we understand what it's like getting something to happen globally. Mm -hmm.